When I was young, my parents were active in South Africa where we lived. My childhood was spent there. They were active alongside Nelson Mandela in the fight against apartheid. Both my parents were put in jail. Both of them were issued with banning orders that stopped them taking part in political activity. And then we had to leave the country when I was 16 because they stopped my father working. The government would not allow him to work. So we couldn't earn a living as a family. And when I came here, I got involved in the fight against apartheid in Britain uh, and led the campaign to stop all white uh, South African sports tours by running on the pitch, by laying siege to the team in its hotel and that kind of non-violent direct action. And I suppose that gave me politics in my blood, initially from my parents and then in the anti-apartheid struggle, which is how I uh, came to join the Labour Party, which had been very involved in supporting the anti-apartheid movement. And eventually, though I never expected it at the time, I was a student at Queen Mary College in the early 1970s. I never thought I'd be a member of parliament, uh, but to end up as a member of parliament and then, of course, to go into government as well. And um, that's, that's great. Uh, you, you were the world secretary, you were secretary of uh, Nor Northern Ireland, you were pension and ward secretary. And um, my, and in your interviews, you, quite, you mentioned two names, Tony Benn and uh, Nelson Mandela, and you say that they inspired you to pursue a political career. So what are the similarities uh, between these two characters? Well, Nelson Mandela has always been my hero, and I was privileged enough to know him once he'd gone out of, come out of prison. My parents knew him when we were living in Pretoria, and they were active in the struggle. And he's always seemed to me to be a unique, extraordinary character, but not just because of his courage and his leadership, but also because he was a people's person, despite becoming an international celebrity when he emerged from prison. He never forgot a friend. He never uh, overlooked uh, an ordinary citizen. He was always a people's person. And I think that's a very, very important thing that politicians at the top often neglect and forget. Tony Benn inspired me to join the Labour Party because I, at that stage, um, uh, he was speaking the kind of uh, values and talking about socialism in a way that could be popular and could engage the public. And that's what inspired me to join the Labour Party. So they were very different uh, routes of inspiration. But uh, with all due respect to Tony Benn, I'm, as I'm sure he would have agreed, he would not put himself in the same category as Nelson Mandela because I don't think anybody else in the world is or was. Absolutely, no, absolutely right. Um, but um, the two were really, I think they were inspirational uh, because um, they, they fought for what they believed in. And uh, in your tribute to Tony Benn, you say that as, uh, as he became older, he, uh, he was more convinced of what he, he was doing because when we, 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 when we become older, we become more Tory, we become more conservative, but he, he, he got more radical. So, um, like Nelson Mandela, and I think, and these two, they were they're inspirational. Well, well, for Tony yeah, Benn, yeah, I did say when he he died that as he got older, he defied the laws of politics yes. by becoming more radical. Yes. Usually, it's the opposite way around. Yes, uh, Nelson Mandela, is it? I think it's a different comparison with him. He went into prison as as a freedom fighter, a burly young freedom fighter. He came out as an elderly world statesman, ready to heal the nation on the edge of civil war and to pull it back from that and to lead the country forward and to bring it together uh, after the, one of the most evil racist systems, probably the most evil racist system the world has seen. So I think they have some similarities, but I think they also have important differences. Yeah, absolutely right. And my, um, you were the Welsh Secretary, for, um, and uh, my question is that given the national service that British are entitled to, why, uh, why patients in Wales, they are subject to second class service compared to patients here in England? I don't agree that Welsh patients are uh, condemned to second class service. Mm -hmm. 
I think it's an outrageous political attack by the Conservatives, which they're doing for party reasons rather than because of the truth. For example, cancer treatment in Wales is much, much better and quicker than it is in England. In England, you have to wait two weeks often to see a doctor. That isn't the case in Wales. In England, you have privatisation of uh, doctor's services. Uh, that isn't happening in Wales. Some things are better in Wales, some things are better in England. And equally, of course, some things are worse than each other in, in, in certain specialities. So I don't accept that it's a separate well, waiting, hour, waiting hours, actually, um, in Wales, it's 26 weeks. And here, it's, uh, in England, it's 18 weeks. So it's a difference of eight weeks. We, we as a Labour government brought it down in England to 18 weeks from what had been years under the Conservatives when we, when we came to power in 1997. And yes, the Wales waiting times are a bit longer, a matter of weeks longer, but they're calculated differently. And they, it, the comparison is not exactly one with the other. But I'm not saying the Welsh um, health service is perfect, it's got lots of faults. The English health service has got many, many faults, which are being made worse at the present time by this government. And uh, the National Ambulance Service, uh, it's not great either in, in Wales because uh, patients, they're stuck in the ambulance for hours because there, 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 are, no, um, um, there are no free beds in the hospital. So um, do you think that we should tackle these problems? This is a problem which the Welsh government, because of course devolution exists in Wales, the Welsh, gov the Welsh Health Service is run by the Welsh government yes. and its agencies. Uh, and the question of um, queuing up in ambulances outside accidents and emergency services because there's a lack of a bed is a, is a very serious one and a complex one because people are often going to accidents and emergency because they can't get access to a local doctor uh, at the weekends or out of hours. Uh, and and that, that has to be changed. Um, a few days ago I met someone who was Welsh and he, he went to a hospital and um, and then he needed help but um, and then uh, he just called the nurse and the nurse told him that sh the nurse wasn't enough trained to help him. So is that normal? No, that's not normal. Uh, it's obviously that's, that's, that's wrong. Yes. But for instance, uh, on, in respect to doctors, uh, we are recruiting proportionately in Wales more doctors than is happening in England. So, and we're training more doctors. Um, so, as I say, some things are better in Wales, some things are worse than England. Uh, but it doesn't help uh, the facts or the truth to just have a political attack from the Conservatives of a quite, quite disgraceful kind. When the Prime Minister says, that offers Dyke the border between England and Wales is the border between life and death. That is an outrageous thing to say, an absolutely outrageous thing to say. For a prime minister to say that, he should be ashamed of himself. Yes, it was. Yes, I remember. It. You're right. And now um, let let us to uh, talk about the um, situation in Northern Ireland, and um, because you were the um, you were the Secretary of Northern Ireland uh, in 2007, so and, uh, where um, the peace deal was reached, and uh, it was, of course, um, it was the uh, morning, uh, fr Friday morning, 1997, but afterward, just your time. So, um, rather, my question is, rather than incurring enormous expenditure and effort pursuing the crimes committed during troubles decades ago, where uh, the evidence is difficult to establish and all impossible. So, and that unjustified grievances of victims, um, including widows, uh, police officers, prison officers, should be addressed in other ways so that Northern Ireland can move on from its hideous past. That's been my argument that there's too much in Northern Ireland today is trapped in the past and it needs to look to the future. Not to forget about the atrocities and certainly not to forget about the victims, many of whom have suffered grievously and have, in many cases, they don't know what happened to their loved ones. They don't know who committed the atrocity, who murdered or assassinated them. Some of them just disappeared, never to be seen again. And so, um, it's not to forget all of that, 
But the problem is this, and it's not being recognized by the politicians there, many of whom have attacked me, around 90% of the cases cannot be solved by the prosecution route because the evidence cannot be found. These are 40, sometimes nearly 50 years old. And you have to do it in another way. There have been two reports, official reports, by Lord Eames and Dennis Bradley in 2009 and by the American specialist uh, uh, called the Haas Report, uh, J Richard Haas, just uh, at the end of last year. They have suggested different approaches, as has the Northern Ireland Attorney General. But the politicians in Northern Ireland have yet to grasp this, and they must do so urgently because a lot of suffering is being caused amongst the victims. And they, 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 they're being led down a false path by saying that we should just prosecute and prosecute and prosecute when it's never going, these cases in, in the most part are never going to come to trial. And what about the letters that they were revealed in February to three months ago? And um, are these letters a uh, sign of um, amnesty or immunity? No. Uh, none of those letters, around 200, which were received by people who inquired as to whether they were wanted by the police. That is what happened. Uh, there weren't an amnesty. Uh, if different evidence came to light, the, le the letters made it clear that they would be, um, they could be prosecuted. An amnesty means you, you are given an amnesty um, from whatever you've done. In these cases, the police did not have any evidence sufficient to take the case against them. They were not wanted by the police. That is what the letters said. And it was a, an essential part of getting Sinn Féin and those of its members who supported the IRA, who would committed some of these atrocities in the past, uh, into the peace settlement that I negotiated and which we concluded in 2007. And now Northern Ireland has had seven years of relative peace and tranquility and stability uh, and without the kind of victims that were dying every day, every week during the bad times of the past because we needed to get um, the supporters of, of the IRA to sign up to policing and justice. They would not have done it if we hadn't addressed this issue in this way. And. Um the other question is about the historical encounter between uh, the Queen and uh, Marjorie McKinnis and she and they they had a dinner together. Do you think that um, is was it the right act to uh, to take? Was it the right step to take uh, to uh, to just put a term to all these uh, um, I don't know, grievances? I think the Queen deserves a lot of praise mm. for meeting the Deputy First Minister of Northern Ireland, Mark McGuinness, who is a, it's acknowledged that he was an IRA commander uh, in the early 1970s. And um, the Queen's um, cousin was assassinated by the IRA, uh, Lord Mount Batten. Uh, so that was very symbolic of the enormous change that has taken place. The, the, there will be no such assassinations in the future because of the peace settlement in which Martin McGuinness and other leaders of the Republican movement in Sinn Féin have played an absolutely crucial role. So yes, I think it's part of, of the Queen saying we need to move forward and in her, her way if she can not forget what happened, but at least recognize that she can shake the hands of um, a former IRA leader who's now the democratically elected Deputy Minister, First Minister, then that's a good thing. I remember on question time in February, you said that uh, we should move on and we should forget the past. But uh, I never said we should forget the past. You said but we should move on. But uh, many people they they got offended and they said that we we lost our I don't know members of family, so uh, we cannot move on. So um, do do you think that we're gonna we're gonna actually uh, we're gonna leave we're gonna just live with this? Uh, not for, 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 for a century, something like that? Or? That's why this matter needs to be dealt with in another way. No. I didn't say forget it. I said deal, it, deal with it in another way. And the official reports which were done for the government are sitting there with some very excellent proposals and ideas on how to do that. Uh, and 
yet the, all the victims are being offered is, is, is prosecutions, when the prosecutions won't succeed because the police can't get the evidence. So I'm on the side of the victims, and I think that they should be, um, they should get a practical alternative in which they can get some conclusion and some kind of uh, end to all of this, which they aren't being offered at the moment, and that's why they're angry, and I understand that. Now uh, let us um, change the subject. We're going to talk about the current situation in Iraq. Tony Blair, as you know, yesterday he wrote an essay, which was um, the, uh, revealed. Um, um, he wrote it on his website that I'm not the one to blame for the current situation in Iraq. So if Tony Blair is not the one to blame, who is to blame for the current situation in Iraq? The conflict in Iraq at the present time, especially between Shia and Sunni Muslims, is very, very serious. Uh, I, some of it maybe can be explained by the Iraq invasion of 2003, but it is developed onto a whole new dimension. So you get jihadis on the Sunni side of a very extreme, almost um, primeval kind that uh, just assassinate people, as we've seen. Uh, because they're of a different religion. It's not that they're Americans or British, they're just a different form of Sunni. It's a reminder of the, the terrible conflict between Catholics and Protestants in Europe centuries ago. Some terrible barbarities were committed there. And the same thing is now happening with uh, extreme jihadi Sunnis um, against Shia uh, Muslims. Uh, and it's, it needs to be resolved in the region. I think uh, Iraq is important. The Iraqi government must govern in a different way and include the Sunnis within, not the extremists, but the Sunni uh, representatives, which they haven't been doing. Um, uh, and uh, Iran needs to be brought in into helping solve the problem as well. So you think that West, they cannot resolve the problem anymore. Now, um, Iraq's neighbors should go and uh, to um, actually to go and, and help the Iraqi government. Well, I think Iran will help the Iraqi government, mm -hmm. and I think it should be encouraged to do so, um, because the difficulty with the Sunni Shia conflict it's in Syria, it's in other, it's broken out in other parts of uh, the region in Bahrain, for example. It's quite serious. Uh, and um, it can destabilize these countries mm -hmm. and plunge them into civil, almost civil war, which is what you're seeing in the north of Iraq at the present time. Well, what people, they argue, they say Saddam was a, actually he did horrors, you know, he killed, he massacred he his own people. But at least he, the region, they were, uh, it was, they were united at his time there wasn't any sectarian conflict in the region, and now it is. And he, and he kept, uh, and then he saved uh, the region from uh, jihadists, um, from jihadists and old um, ISIS and all these, uh, the other terrorist groups, so, uh, like Qaddafi. So, um, do you think that we should have, uh, we shouldn't have toppled Saddam Hussein? Well, the reason that I supported the war and the invasion of Iraq was I thought there were weapons of mass destruction mm -hmm. there. I genuinely, honestly thought that. Mm -hmm. and so did most people uh, right across the world. Even those countries like France that didn't support the invasion, they thought Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. Germany as they well. Were, Germany as well, Russia too. But um, there weren't any. So if I'd known there weren't any, I wouldn't have voted for to, to invade. But that's history. Mm -hmm. um, what matters now is we support a change in Iraq, in Iraq. We support a different type of government policy that brings the, the Sunni representatives into government and makes that part of the population feel included. Uh, and that we try to get rid of these um, terrorists because they're very, very dangerous. We see what's happening in Nigeria, we see what's happening in Somalia, many other countries in the world, um, and of course Syria, of, of, of murderous um, 
jihadis, some of whom are British fighters, by the way, going there. Uh, and that is the real problem. And, and we neglect that at our peril. And um, today, I don't know if you saw um, Guardian coverage at the pictures you know, of the horror in Iraq. Do you think that media, they should reveal these horrors um, by showing pictures or putting videos on their website? I do think that the public should see this barbarity going on to understand how terrible it is, how medieval it is. Um, and to return to your question about Saddam Hussein, remember Iraq, before Saddam took power, was one of the most prosperous, developed countries, modern countries in the region, with good public services, with a good business culture, with a strong educated middle class. And Saddam turned it into, he destroyed all those things. Uh, he was an evil dictator. I mean, he, he has killed as a, as a, and ordered the killings of more Muslims, or nearly a million, many of them Iranians in the Iran Civil War, uh, Iraq War, um, than any other world leader. He was an evil barbarian, uh, Kurds as, as well, yes. He, an evil, barbarous dictator. And it's a good thing he's out of the way. Uh, and I don't think that um, ev evil, bar barbarous tyrannies should be supported anywhere, mm -hmm. even if the consequences of them going are difficult, as we've seen in, uh, in the, the conflict in Iraq at the present time. But the minority groups, they're not uh, protected anymore. Christians or other groups, they're not protected. At least at Saddam's, they were protected. No? That's a good point. but. Would you have wanted to live in Saddam Hussein's Iraq? I don't think so. And that is, that is the answer to the question. Absolutely. And so, um, so um, and my first question is about um, and local and general uh, and European elections. And um, Ed Miliband, he was criticized uh, by Labour back, uh, backbenchers for n Nothing uh, for not having attacked UKIP, uh, and he underestimated UKIP. Um, do you do you agree with that? Or? Well, I think UKIP are a phenomenon of the anti-politician mood at the present time. Mm -hmm. um, the Liberal Democrats used to have some of that vote, but they betrayed their principles and, and completely. Like when they told students before the last election tuition that they'd abolish tuition yeah. fees, and then they trebled them. Um, so they've destroyed trust in politics, and that's why they've lost a lot of support. And UKIP has uh, hoovered up a lot of that um, anti-politics feeling. Uh, and I think there should have been a more targeted campaign against UKIP by the Labour Party. And there needs to be in the future. Um, uh, and you know, I think there will be lessons drawn by Ed Miliband and others about that. Yes, uh, your colleagues, before... Um and the European and local election, they were saying that actually um, um, conservative voters are going to defect to, uh, to UK, but not Labour. And at the end, after the elections, it was re revealed that, I don't know, more than 20% of, not 20, yeah, about around 20% of Labour voters they defected to UK. And he, uh, he didn't see, he didn't, he just underestimated UK. Well, um whether or not that was true, it, it's a problem that Labour needs to deal with. And it's a problem that I think we deal with, not by trying to outbid UKIP on immigration policy and trying to become, you know, like them, but actually dealing with the issues about which there's dis discontent and that a lot of people express that discontent by voting UKIP. Though they wouldn't want UKIP to be the government. And they certainly couldn't see Nigel Farage being the Prime Minister. But nobody sees him as that figure. Um, they have to deal with the fact that there's not enough housing, affordable housing for rental purchase for people. And so they see what, when, they, when their children can't get housing in working class areas, they get very resentful um, because they think other people that are occupying the houses. And also on jobs, we need much better job security. A lot of um, migrants are working in jobs on terrible pay under the minimum wage, illegal, and that undercuts the, the wages of British workers. That breeds um, a lot of anger as well, and, and UKIP are, 
are kind of get, getting that vote. So we've got to come up with policies that say, as Ed Miliband is doing, that you need a living wage, that we need hundreds of thousands of more houses, and this government's completely failing to do that, which is why we need to change. But you talk about housing, um, but if you um, if you look at a new Labour's performance, you can see that um, during uh, 14 years, uh, no, sorry, yes, um, 12 years of um, 13 years of new Labour. There were you built less than 100,000 houses, so that's why even labor voters they don't believe when you say we're gonna we're gonna build more than I don't know 300,000 houses now. Yeah, I understand that. I mean, I was I was 12 years a government minister. I was very concerned throughout that we weren't building enough houses. And we did a lot of other things. We repaired the national health service, which was people were dying in corridors on trolleys waiting for vital operations when we came to power in 1997. The Conservatives were just destroying the health service. Our schools were in a terrible state. Uh, and we didn't do enough on the housing because we were focusing on health and, and education. You can't do everything. Yeah. There's always a limited amount of money to spend. And the other thing we did is we brought crime right down by recruiting more police officers. So you can't do everything, but we should have built more houses. There's no question about that. And um, about Labour's manifesto, um, do you think that can we have, we're going to have uh, some red lines about uh, coalition with Lib Dems or not? Well, I don't think there'll be anything in the manifesto about that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're fighting for a majority in the next, um, to be a majority government. And I think we will be in government. Um, whether we can get a majority, it's very hard in the current political system because of the rise of, 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 of other parties. Very hard for any party to get the majority. I don't think the Conservatives can win the next election. Um, and many of them will tell you that here. Uh, but, um, I, you know, we want a majority. If, if we get a result uh, that we're, there's a hung parliament and we don't have a majority and the Conservatives don't have a majority, well, we'll have to look at what we do about that. You say that you want a majority, but if... Um in September, um, Scottish, they vote yes to, to um, independence, so you're going to lose 40 of your seats. So in that case, you can't have a majority. Well, when Labour has won a general election, clearly, with a, with a good majority, we've always won in England. So it doesn't follow that if there were no Scottish MPs, we couldn't form a government. We have done in the past. Um, but it is nevertheless would be a very big blow politically to the Labour Party. But the reason for voting no to independence on September the 18th is not to do with the Labour Party's fortune, it's to do with the fact that it's bad for Scotland and it's bad for Britain. Uh, and there are a whole number of reasons for that. It's bad economically, it's bad you know, for Scotland to become a very small nation of five million with China of a, a billion India of a billion, Russia becoming more powerful, America powerful. You need to be part of a wider country to be have a representative on the Security Council, the leadership of the European Union, NATO, the World Trade Talks, um, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, and so on. And none of that, Scotland wouldn't get any of that if it went independent. It would be a tiny little nation on its own. And about... Um what about Europe? Because um, and, and these um, th um, these few weeks we just uh, hear about um, David Cameron, who's trying to stop Mr. Juncker to become uh, the European um, the president of the European Parliament. But but Ed Miliband, he's silent on this issue. So do you think that he's afraid of splitting the Labour Party? No, I I think he has said in the last week that actually he doesn't think. Um, Juncker would be a good choice for Europe either. So no, I don't think he's been silent at all, and nor do I think this issue would split the Labour Party. One of the things that has been so impressive about Ed Miliband's leadership is the party stuck together. There's been great unity. It, when previous serious defeats happened, and the 2010 defeat was very serious, the party has been bitterly divided, like in 1983 and 1979. There were big, big divisions and fights within the party. None of that now, because of the way Ed Miliband has, has governed and led the party. 